Well, welcome. Glad you could make it. Everybody having a, a good week so far? Yes? Anybody asleep? <laughs> Please Midway tell us, then we yeah. will keep you awake. So we'll start in about two minutes. Yeah. Before we actually start, I would like to see what kind of people are in the room, what level. So some questions, and if you would like to raise your hand, then we know how we can tell you our story. Who knows PowerShell? Actually programming instead of knowing what it is. OK. Uh, who is responsible for security? Who is dealing with those annoying end users? OK, so we have a very mixed group. That's great. That's great. Quick one. Uh, how about you throw your hand up if you're in the middle of or have deployed VDI in your environment? Not that many hands. A few hands? OK. Considering it in the next 12 months? Same hands? <laughs> Couple. OK. Just curious. Uh, who is dealing with all those cool new devices that people bring without you controlling it? That's a lot. Did we get to Brad's keynote today? Were you in the client keynote this morning? Kind of heads nodding a little bit, yeah. yeah. It was early, and it was <laughs> for this time, for this part of the world, you know, this city, that was a very early time of day. Many just went right through last night and powered through that keynote. But uh, we're gonna try and reference that today. You know, Brad dropped some some very interesting data points around the balance being achieved between IT and end users and how the the compliance aspects and security and control have to roll up to the leadership of a business. So we're going to try and touch on some of that today and relate that strategy that Microsoft and System Center specifically are driving forward with and executing on beautifully. It's been very exciting to watch. Uh, we'll try and tie some of that in today for you and show you how we view IT as a service in, in that model. You know, it's a changing model. It's dynamic. You know, your users have an opinion that is an influential opinion. Um, and this is tough to deal with. You know, this is a really unique event where uh, we get a very uh, focused collection of people to come and talk about some very interesting topics. So we hope you find some value in spending your time with us today. And thank, thanks for joining us and sharing your hour with us. So, so we're kind of on the, the hour, so why don't we kick it off and get going? Yes, yeah, so my name is Bob de Kousmaker. Uh, I'm responsible for the product management organization within RES Software. And I will do the demos today. So I hope for you that something goes wrong. Uh, I hope for me that everything goes very smooth. My name is Jeff Wetlaufer. Uh, I'm with RES Software as well. And uh, my responsibility is, is around the alliance, the relationship to Microsoft, a little product marketing thrown in there. Uh, I was, at this time last year, in the System Center team at Microsoft. So it's been a homecoming week, and it's been a lot of fun being back and seeing everybody. So um, we've got some, some, some heritage to talk about, some relationships. We've been a, you know, RES Software is a company that's been around the Microsoft stack for over 10 years. It's actually about 13 years. Um, you know, beginning way back on the days of, you know, the early days of uh, Citrix, WinFrame, MetaFrame technologies, and going through all the iterations of SMS and all those technologies, right through Config, uh, and the latest uh, deployments around even the data center side with Orchestrator and Service Manager. So, uh, we'll try and uh, you know, give you relationship comments about that technology alignment throughout the session today as well, so you uh, see, understand, and, and, and see it resonate about what we're doing and why we're doing it. Uh, but today we're talking about IT as a service, you know, delivering IT as a service to your customers. Your customers are often an end user. There are sometimes a, a collection of end users if you're some kind of a partner delivering services. Um, but it's a really complex environment, and we're going to show you how you can provide automation to that, um, how you can deliver controlled experiences that are uh, compliant, you know, governance and compliance, some of the things Brad talked about this morning. Um, in an ever-changing world where your users are digital natives, they are, they are you know, dialed in on technology and hardware and, and applications and self-servicing um, those environments themselves if IT doesn't provide it for them. So we want to show you how some of our technology can align to that and, and help you bring automation with that control uh, in a highly personalized experience. Let's kick it off. Let's get into it. So uh, the word consumerization has been really used heavily within the industry. Many of you are uh, seeing it, you know, COIT, COIT, consumerization of IT. These are terms that are, are resonating heavily with, with everyday administrators or the leadership of IT organizations. And within consumerization experiences, you know, the users are 
Uh, they're, they're a very challenging bunch of people to work with. You know, they're going down to the retail experience and buying their own technology. They're bringing it in and they, they want to use it inside their daily productive experiences. To give them a service model, to provide them IT as a service based on what an IT guy used to know about but can no longer really predict sometimes what is the target out there uh, can be very challenging. And so we want to talk about how the things like that, what Microsoft refers to as the flexible work style, that, uh, that concept of working on different devices in different locations, uh, different times of day, you know, how you can deliver services to those experiences in a consistent, secure, provisioned, uh, predictable way uh, using things like RAS software with System Center. Uh, we want to talk a little bit about today something we term as follow me data. Uh, that leads towards something else like follow me IT. Follow me data is a concept we will show you. We will define that today, demonstrate some technology for you that we believe is, is, is an example of follow me data uh, services and show you how that can be rolled into your service offerings that you provide end users. So they're not going out and getting a Dropbox account or a Live Mesh account or something of that nature and putting corporate data that's breaking compliance rules within that. Uh, we'll show you how we can provide you a service that delivers uh, a compliant and secure on-premises experience similar to that type of uh, technology. We also want to touch on how you can automate these things because the last thing you guys want to do in this room is go home and have to provide all kinds of custom written scripts and, and different tools and consoles and views uh, or go and add layers of infrastructure complexity to what you're trying to do today to keep those guys happy. Uh, the more complex that gets, you, know, you heard Brad talk about it, it's, it's got resource impacts, it's got training impacts, cost model impacts. So in order to do that IT as a service delivery, you've got to think about how to automate as much of it as possible. Uh, and we'll talk about how to bring predictability to that automation uh, and how those workspace experiences can be delivered uh, in a highly predictable but also highly automated fashion. We're going to spend a bit of time today and talk about context awareness. RAS software believes that we have an ability to provide definitions, IT policy, IT control, yet highly personalized context aware services. We're going to show you what we mean by context. And when you think about like a System Center 2012 configuration manager product and its application model and the deployment types that live inside there, yeah, that is an ability to define context for something like a software delivery scenario. Based on these rules being set up, here's four or five deployment types. You know, Bill was on stage with Brad today showing all those DTs for Adobe Reader. That's a deployment type. You know, those, those are contextual-based rules for application delivery. But what about the other 80% of your IT experience where the users are going to different buildings, they are going outside of corporate regions of, of, of networks, VLANs, or different buildings within uh, a campus, uh, and they want to have things like a printer follow them, or uh, they might be working at home, or you might have contract workers who are for fixed periods of time coming in and out of the corporate relationships. And we have to think about context awareness far beyond just software delivery scenarios. So we'll show you how we define context. We'll show you some demos. We'll take you through how we think about it and show you some examples of just exactly what you could do uh, to deliver context to our services uh, within your IT service model. We want to wrap all that up with some service orchestration. You know, one of, the, one of the most important things you can think about when you're delivering IT as a service is providing things like a service catalog to those end users. Service catalogs are far more than just looking for applications and installing them. You know, the, the classic consumerized world today, like your end user's software catalog today, it's Bing and it's Google. You know, they're going and finding their own applications when they can't find them from IT. And you saw some of the cool stuff today that Brad and Bill were showing about sideways delivery, you know, and bringing stuff in from, you know, the config manager console and bringing that in from the different app stores and things like that. That's very cool, very cool indeed. But again, going beyond just software distribution scenarios and providing orchestration for as much as possible and providing automation and workflow and approval gates when they're needed uh, are really going to help you refine that IT as a service model and get it adopted by your end users. At the end of the day, if IT as a service that you're delivering to your end users is not accepted, if they don't think it's valuable, well, we're showing that today with reports from analysts. You know, the data shows they're going to ignore IT. They're going to go and do their own thing, that concept of shadow IT. Um, they're going to go and find their own solution. So we want to show you ways that you can use our technology with Microsoft Stack uh, to really help get some of that adoption and acceptance going. We want to finish the day off by showing you how we can talk about preparing you for IT as a service. You know, many of you today are thinking about hybrid models, cloud, on and off premises, uh, services, uh, but you're also trying to think about how you can simplify things, reduce your costs, improve service levels, get ahead of the curve and stop being reactive. 
Begin, beginning to go on that journey of delivering IT as a service is gonna, is gonna be a series of steps you have to make. And your legacy technologies you may have had for, you know, some of this stuff's been around five, 10 years. You know, I used to talk to customers who still had SMS 03. You know, some of that stuff can be a really big, heavy lifting process to move out and replace. But we wanna show you how you can think about IT as a service as you move forward. And think about delivering services um, that are much more agile and elastic than your previous implementations of technology. And we're going to wrap up with, with mapping out how we align to System Center. We'll show you some of that through our demos as well uh, to give you some good ideas. And, and if you don't see enough today, we've got a great booth down. Walk in the main uh, expo floor, hang a right with a great big orange uh, booth there. Come on down. We've got some great demos showing all this integration in action down there. Uh, and we've got all kinds of guys down there who can do great demos and discussions with you in kind of a, an interactive way. Okay, so just to begin talking about how, you know, Microsoft's obviously been positioning this concept of the flexible work style uh, to their audiences, both to people like us as a partner, but also to their end customers. And when you think about the flexible work style, well, it's, it's ripe for service delivery models. You think about things like anywhere connectivity, you know, working in different locations, productivity and, and home working are, are, are married now. The work-life balance is blurred. We all know that. And we don't have to repeat that too many times. But... One of the things that's driving that is, is personalization. You know, people want to work in a way they're comfortable working. Uh, the generations of workforce coming out of the, uh, the university bases today and entering the workforce, you know, they have preferences and they are technical. They understand how to buy stuff. They understand what to use it and how to use it in different locations and, and get their own IT services uh, wrapped around that. But they want personalization. They want control. You know, Brad talked about control and how IT can have a married relationship with that control model. Well, we have to find a balance between giving them enough control and enough personalized experience to understand that they're in their own world there and they're working in the way that they want to work. But the IT organization is answering their checkboxes by delivering security, being compliant, and being able to report on that or audit that or deliver services through those discussions. And part of that is what you, know, you heard referred to this morning and probably through other sessions this week about intelligent infrastructure being able to provide those services. You're going to have people who want to work outside the corporate boundaries. You're going to have people who want to work at home or in the Starbucks coffee shop or here in a hotel like this this week. And if your infrastructure is not prepared for those requests to come inbound, well, they just, their productivity will fall off the, the side of the map. So being able to provide intelligent infrastructure that is, is prepared for that, that scenario list, uh, but also responsive enough so that if something comes up and those users don't have something available to them, they can make a request or a workflow kickoff uh, that can accommodate that request. You can see so down on the bottom there, working on the road, working with own devices, um, working on different things like phones and slates. Um, this is becoming more and more present in the enterprise today. Um, and down the right side, you can see how we are, as we're talking this week in, in the entire event, talking about unifying management across those devices and simplifying that. You know, raise your hand today if you were surprised when Brad talked about Droid and iOS and all that being managed. I was pretty blown away. That, that's a pretty big deal, right? You know, how many of you have been waiting for that? That's, that's, a, that's a huge thing for you guys. Yeah, a couple of guys are nodding their heads. Um, it's going to simplify your lives, but it's also going to add complexity in some ways because those devices are coming in, and they're going to be touching your corporate assets and looking for your services to be connected to them. And they're going to ask you. Um, sometimes it was interesting, that data between 39 and 69%, the company thinks about 30-something percent are, are using personal devices. Well, when they surveyed the users, it was twice that. Uh, I believe that. You know, both of us are, are guilty of doing that ourselves. So let's talk for a moment about follow me data. The world of consumerized IT is, is not just about running on hardware that you prefer. The end user has gone down to their retail outlet or, or purchased something online and it's what they want to use. It's you know, a small clamshell, an ultra book, a slate of some kind. Um, you know, that, that is evolving. That, that is a process that is ongoing and, and getting more and more complex every day with some of the exciting hardware coming out, especially with Win8 and some of the ARM technology and some of that. Uh, but really, it's not just about the device and, and things like the OS or the applications that are running on those devices. It's about them accessing their data. For example, why would a user go and get Dropbox installed on their machine, both their home and their work laptop? Well, they have to get their data accessed. They have to get their data replicated. And follow me data is a concept that is actually very important in that service model. To be able to provide them not just the applications they need when they need them on the device and the experience they're, they're finding themselves in, but the data within those applications so they can be productive. And it might be a worksheet, it might be a PowerPoint deck, it could be their email data. It's a collection of different forms of data. But follow me data is critical, and providing them a service that has that flexibility, that control, that security model in place, 
so that you know that they're putting data into your follow me data model that is not based in a public cloud somewhere as a free consumer based service. Um, it's under your control. It is under your governance and compliance requirements that you're establishing. <clears throat> when we think about that, we think about context. Context is very important in this, in this scenario. Context can be defined by things like identity. Who is the person? It's Bob, it's Jeff, whoever it may be. What is the location that that user has found themselves in at that moment? You know, is it a corporate location? Is it a personal location? Is it a trusted or untrusted connection? You know, do we know the pipe they're sitting on? Is it just 3G, 4G, LTE, whatever it may be? Or is it a public Wi-Fi that is unsecured? What's the device they're on? What's the architecture of that device? Do we know and understand that's architect that architecture? Can we deliver things to that architecture? Or do we need to find out more about it? And then time. You know, time is seven days a week, 24 hours a day. People find productivity scenarios in, in ways that they didn't five years ago. You know, we all go home and plug in our laptops when the kids have gone to bed, and we find ourselves you know, tapping away for another hour or two sometimes. You, know, you don't want to be limited in that respect because IT's gone home. You want to be able to keep yourselves going and be productive. But data is a critical part of this. You know, data is extremely important in all of this because if you haven't got access to your data, um, you're going to simply find yourself you know, looking for other solutions and ways to provide it for you. So when we talk about that, the overarching situation that becomes an issue is security. And as we talk to customers, we're going to talk in a moment about our solution for Follow Me Data. Um, one of the biggest issues with our customers we polled, we went out and spoke to our existing customer base and said, do you know who's using a, a file replication technology? Do you know uh, what data they're putting in that cloud? Are they replicating that to an un, a non-corporate asset machine? Do you even know? And most of them went, don't know, need to know, and I need something that can help me understand that and, and control it. That's all based in security. In some parts of the world, you know, we're a Dutch company from the Netherlands, and, and there's some parts of the Europe region that are very secure and very concerned about security and privacy and data protection. Um, and that's evident here in the US as well. So security is one of the most important factors of that follow me data model. So with that, we want to provide you an announcement. Uh, RES Hyperdrive is our follow me data solution. Um, we are announcing here this week at MMS the uh, release candidate of this product. We are running it internally, uh, using it heavily as we prepared for this event this week. Uh, and it will be available in the next 30 days for you as customers. But it's all being demonstrated down at our, our booth today. And we're going to actually move into a demo right now and show you what it looks like. So RAS Hyperdrive is a technology from RAS software. It's been um, designed with the consumer in mind. It's an end user experience focused product. Uh, we're going to show you how it integrates, how it works with your existing storage. Uh, it's a virtual appliance that lives inside your environment on premises. Uh, it has abilities to interact with your mail client and do attachment redirection. Um, but it's stored in your data center, on your storage. Uh, so we're going to move, I think, right now to a demo. To a demo. So Over to you, Bob. As Jeff said, we are using it internally. And what we experience, and probably a lot of uh, organizations will experience the same thing if they have a solution like this, or they are already experiencing with an unsupported solution like Dropbox. We enabled this solution, and suddenly we were out of this space. Why? Because this is a very intuitive solution, like a Dropbox, like a Microsoft Mesh. People know how to use drives, and they just put information on it. We do provide already SharePoint. But for some reason, dropping files in a drive is much easier to use, and it's actually being used. So suddenly, we see all kinds of shared resources on this solution within our company. So finally, there is a solution, apparently, that people can use. So they are not restricted in what they want to do. And that's also something that is shifting that we see. In the past, IT was about restricting because we have to be compliant. But now that there are so many solutions that the end users can buy themselves or even get five gig for free, and they can just bring themselves to the office on the iPad that they just bought, we cannot stop it anymore. And then it's very important, it's better to deliver the same flexibility so they are not shopping outside our IT store versus restricting that they cannot do it because they will find other ways. They will use Hotmail to send it to their personal account because there they have the flexibility that they need to be productive. So the hyperdrive solution, you will see the use is very, very intuitive. It is seamlessly integrated in the Microsoft experience, the Microsoft Windows experience, so they don't need to use additional clients. They can just use what they are used to today. So what I want to show is 
a default Windows desktop, I have a default Windows Explorer, and I have several drives. These drives are hyperdrives. They are automatically synchronized with my data center. Everything which is automatically synchronized with my data center is also automatically available on all the mobile devices that we support. So, for a user, there's no difference with how they work today with their Windows Explorer, how they browse to the files, how they open the documents. In this case, you can simply add information to files. The system will automatically detect that there are changes. In the bottom, you will see that there's automatically a synchronization to the data center through a virtual appliance on your own storage, on-premise. A user doesn't have to do anything. They can just work as they work today. Another important part of data is being able to share the information. So if I want to share information with somebody within my organization, I can put it today on a file server. But what if I want to share it with somebody I work with who is outside my organization? How do I do it today? I will probably add it to my email and then send it with my email. But what if my PowerPoint presentation exceeds the volume that my IT organization allows me to send through email. And probably I will bring it on a USB drive and I will do it with Hotmail at home because they don't have those restrictions. So again, simply sharing information like a nice movie. You just send a file link. The data remains in your data center. The end user will receive a link. And as you can see, there are some options. You can automatically expire the link. You can determine that it can only be downloaded once. So it cannot be redistributed again by the person you're sending it to. You can also set an additional password for security. So this is a very easy solution for end users to share information with the outside world without abusing the systems that we have today that are not meant for sharing documents. I can also share folders. Why do I want to share a folder? If I do have a collaboration going on with an external company that is assisting me in setting up this event, I want to have a folder present where we can share information, where we can update each other's documents. So exactly the same way, sharing folders is just right mouse click, share this folder. And then we have the ability to open this folder for modifications if we want to allow our counterparty to yeah, do edits on our documents. Another way that people are used to share information is Outlook. So within Outlook, I have some samples where I already sent myself email. They will simply receive an email where a file link is present. By clicking the file link, they will be redirected to a browser and the file will be downloaded. If you put a password on it, you can only download it once the password is entered. So, very intuitive, but sending new emails, attaching same kind of documents. So, the attachment is added to the email, but we detect that there is an attachment and we will ask you do you want to replace this attachment? You can even decide any attachment above 5 meg automatically replace it with the file link. So let's replace it with the file link. Again, the same options that were there before are available also within Outlook. And the attachment is removed from the email and a file link is inserted in the email. So again, we use the existing tools that people use today, but do deliver this ability to share. So I don't have all kinds of devices. We saw this morning how difficult it is to show all those uh, non-Microsoft devices on a big screen. But by this synchronization that is going on in the background, everything that is changed is automatically synchronized, automatically available on all my mobile devices. And then I'm talking about Windows Phone. I'm talking about BlackBerry, Android, iOS. So very transparent for the user. All those devices have a native application. We have also a web dashboard. So if I'm somewhere, internet cafe, I do want to access my information, I can go to a secure dashboard and there I can access the same information. 
something else. Jeff was talking about security. How do I secure my infrastructure? How do I take care of those devices that are left in a taxi? I want to be able to remote wipe my information which I stored in this solution. So we have a feature called TheftGuard. All the devices that have a local cache are registered within TheftGuard. And from this web dashboard, which is available from anywhere, or even it can be invoked by an IT administrator from a central uh, point of view, I can simply remote wipe a device that I have just lost. So security in follow me data is essential. So you are welcome at our booth to have more information about this solution. Uh, we will continue with uh, other very interesting subjects. But the essence of follow me data is provide the flexibility that our end users are already using today without our approval. But do take care of the security. Do take care of the fact that the data is stored on your hard drive in your data center. I know that, for example, Dropbox has an agreement with Amazon, but if I put a Word document which is confidential on my Dropbox, I have no idea in which country this Word document resides. And the challenge I have is, what is the law that applies to my document? That is the law of the country where it actually resides on a hard drive. And that's the reason why you cannot simply use those cloud services. So security is important. Ability to know where your data is, the ability to remote wipe your devices, but still deliver what people like to use to be more productive. Great, so there's an example of showing you how we have an ability to provide a service that users are already looking for and going and getting themselves. Uh, a bit later on, if we have time, we'll touch on a, a tool we have, a free offering called the, uh, the, the BDA tool, the Baseline Desktop Analyzer tool. Uh, that allows us to uh, understand you know, who's running things like a file sharing utility, what kind of data they have inside of that, that utility, what kind of forms of, of files they're putting in there, to help you prepare for a migration into, in, into an IT controlled asset or an IT controlled service. Great, so now we're going to talk about automation. It has already been discussed this morning in Keynote as well. It's very important to have the tools available to automate your day to day job. Analysts like Gardner still see that 60% of time spent within IT organizations is spent on keeping the lights on. Keeping the lights on or doing very simple tasks like provisioning users will not make a difference. We need more time to enable, to empower users with new technologies. And sometimes we have to say, sorry, we are too busy to keep the lights on. I will not get a clap on my shoulder if I provision a new mailbox. They just expect me to do it. But if I enable new functionality, like follow me data, then, as this morning was explained, people will start smiling. And then you become the hero of IT. I'm not sure if it goes that fast. We have something to uh, present before we have the trust again. But it's important to automate those annoying those repetitive tasks as much as we can so we can focus on empowering people. For automation, it's all about don't do anything manual anymore. Everything I do manual, I cannot repeat one or a thousand times. So do it automatically. But also, don't do it by scripting. Because 50% of the people in the room didn't understand PowerShell. So what if the 50% that does do PowerShell is on holiday or is leaving the company. What is then the value of everything which is automated? What if it breaks down? Who is going to fix it? So you need the tools to do it very intuitive, but do it in a structured way. So we think that by creating a kind of recipes for what you do every day, a kind of run books in a predefined order, with the parameters to make it generic, then you can have a very uh, high level of control over what you change in your organization. You know how it's changed because it's fully automated. It's described within this runbook. And you can repeat it over and over again in exactly the same manner. When I created accounts a few years ago, the accounts that I created for 
users uh, being part of many groups on Monday morning were slightly different than the same type of accounts I did on Friday afternoon when I was already thinking about the weekend. It's manual work, it's difficult, so we need to be consistent in any change we do within IT. And then again, we need to do it based on business rules, not based on personal ideas. So I don't want to go to corporate IT and, and tell them, look, Jeff's going to work with me, uh, create an account and just copy my account. There need to be business rules behind somebody's going to work or somebody needs an IT service, but what are the business rules to create the appropriate IT service for this person? Only then you can automate IT itself. So IT organizations are there to automate other processes in the organization. We always ask, who is automating IT? What is the vendor that delivers the enterprise resource tools for IT itself? Who is automating IT that they don't have to do manual tasks anymore? So a very simple demo to explain how provisioning a user can be created into a recipe and then that recipe we can do once or a thousand times in the same click. So we have a product called Automation Manager and this product provides runbook automation. It's a term that you also recognize from Orchestrator. It's a different product, so don't compare it to Orchestrator. The essence of automation is that within a runbook, we predefine the steps and the tasks that we need to do to empower a user in my company. So provisioning a user is having a runbook, in this case called create a single user, and it has multiple tasks. It's not only the Active Directory, it's also a mailbox. It's also the appropriate group memberships. And probably in your organization there are much more tasks that you need to perform to enable a user so a user can work. So the idea of runbook automation is to create all these tasks in a very intuitive way, preferably by only the mouse instead of PowerShell scripting, then encapsulate that into a runbook and then execute this runbook by just supplying the parameters. So you see all kinds of tasks. If I want to create a new user, I can just schedule this runbook. I enter the parameters. I don't know his phone number, I will do that later in the next demo. And that's all I can do. But this is for one user. I can use exactly the same runbook and say, no, I don't fill it in for one user. I just enter a comma separated file for 1,000 users. We had customers that called us, thank you very much. I downloaded your evaluation software this weekend because the school was starting the week after and I had, it, had to create 10,000 email boxes. And your evaluation allowed me to do this in five minutes. Thank you very much. So it's all about automating in a very intuitive way. So this user is automatically provisioned. All the tasks, the individual tasks, Active Directory, Exchange, uh, user groups are executed by just entering those parameters. So everything is running. You see all the resulting tasks. So keeping it simple, knowing who is doing what, so everything now within this system, any execution of a task, of runbook, is audited. I always know who did what in my infrastructure, what changes have been executed in what order, because this runbook is a fixed order. So now I don't have to worry about uh, the delivering the service of an active user. It's just kicking off this runbook. Later on we will show you how we can do this automatically as well. Okay, thanks Bob. So we're going to spend a bit of time now talking about the concepts of context and how we can define context-aware personalized workspaces. 
And so as you head back to your homes and, 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 and go back into your jobs next Monday and, and try to think about you know, what you could learn from this week and, and, uh, and take and learn and move forward with, if there's one thing I want you to leave this session with is that RES software is unique in the industry around the ability to define and deliver context-aware personalization at the workspace level. Context awareness. So let's talk about what we mean by that. First of all, when we think about the word context, Context is actually a calculation. There are several factors involved in arriving at a point where context is defined. And so let's just explain a couple of the high-level ones, and then we're going to have a few more shows of uh, demo here to show you just exactly how we can show those in, in, inside of our console to be delivered to workspaces. So when you think about the traditional model of OS and application and user layer, and you saw Brad this morning talk about the user experience virtualization concepts, you know, we actually sit above that, you know, this concept of an overlay and this ability to actually take a summary of those experiences, present them, whether that be to a physical targeted machine or to a VDI experience, consistently for that same user uh, is, is a very unique way to say we do this. So when we think about workspaces, let's talk about that for a moment. First of all, we can define context through location. And clearly, location is an obvious one. You're either in the corporate office or you're not. Um, and you may want to do certain things based on that location specifically. Recently, Bob and I spent some time with a very large uh, public sector security organization here in the US. And they talked about their interest in defining uh, a person's security rights because they had certain security on their badge that allowed them to walk through certain doors and go to certain building levels and also enter certain parts of the buildings and campus that were different levels of security. But they also wanted to be able to say that when that asset, that laptop, walked away from that network, the concept of like geofencing, they wanted to not only lock that machine down, make it a brick, basically, but also be notified about it and be told about that situation, that event. And the same applies internally. They're, the guy goes to a different floor, brings his laptop up, and may not even try to do anything, but we know he shouldn't be in that area. You know, that machine can actually become an audited event that says, hey, you know what? That machine's now gone past its security clearance level. That's an easy definition of, of, of location inside of a building. And that's things like VLANs and IP subnets and that kind of stuff. Uh, but then going out of the building, geofencing is, is another way to think about it. So the office is one way. The location is one way. Office uh, or home are two ways we can easily say you're either inside our corporate boundaries or outside our corporate boundaries. And we can define some policies, some IT control measures, some compliancy settings that say, based on that definition being a very easy one to detect, um, we can provide you certain access or not to applications, data, Maybe a, a consistent desktop, a corporate wallpaper, you know, those kinds of things. We got a great demo down in the booth. We just pull the network cable off the laptop, and everything changes. The wallpaper swaps out, icons disappear, applications turn off, because that machine has basically just been undocked and taken home. The laptop's gone home. Well, when you go home, you're a different person. You know, you've got interest in running applications like Skype or Facebook or iTunes or whatever it may be. And more and more, those are put on your corporate asset. That's okay. But when you're in your si inside your corporate environment in certain points of time, you might want to restrict some of those. Uh, and we have an ability to define that based on macro things like location. Another easy one to look at at a high level is devices, desktops or laptops, or even, put that again, device like tablet. You know, based on the architecture of the hardware you're using at that point, that is another variable in the context calculation. So context can also easily look at it and go, oh, that's a Windows 64-bit machine, or that's a Windows 7, or a Windows XP, or Win 8 machine. And let's provide you an experience that's relevant to that experience. Time. Time is also a very important part of this. And probably time is one of the more flexible ones, because we all know productivity goes beyond the 9 to 5 window. Productivity is defined by when you're working. And time is a, is a thing that we can easily say, you know, between 9 and 5, there are certain applications and data we want to make sure you're available with. That might include resources like corporate printers and those kinds of things. But there might also be times of the day or the weekend when you know, you're going to be doing different things. And you're going to be running applications or playing music or, or running Skype or things like that. And we don't want these applications to be accessible to you. Or if they are accessible to you, they're through a hosted, trusted environment like a VDI session or a remote desktop or some other gateway like a Citrix Zen desktop. Those are easy ways to think about d the definitions of context. So those are three things, location, device, time. Those are very high level though, right? Let's get below that now. And Bob's going to show us a couple of examples of just exactly how else you can think about the idea of context. And we'll show you some ways that we can, we can define that within our console. So over to you. Yeah. So we have a product called Workspace Manager. 
which is completely focused on the creation of your desktop and all the components in the desktop, which are not only the application, but also the data and the resources you have access to, uh, the printers, and even the personal settings. So once you have predefined the context rules, so you can detect in which user context this particular user is working, so you can detect the work style. And based on that context, you can create content. So we talked about, in the past, we only focused around the device. Now it's really about the user. As Jeff already said, if Bob de Kousmaak is walking out the door, outside of a restricted area, it's still the same device, still the same Bob de Kousmaker, but for IT and for the confidential information, it's a different Bob de Kousmaker. So we need to have rules, we need to have solutions where I can have a very fine-grained uh, way of determining what the user context is. So it is device type maybe, it is the uh, prerequisite that you need for an application or for, appli for a data to access. Uh, locations based on IP, uh, we are working together with Cisco, they have, uh, are they focusing now on within their active network components to do geofencing kind of capabilities. So using that information you have a very detailed location of your device. You can even use USB devices so if I simply show all the type of rules that you can create, a USB device, a particular serial number or a particular vendor of USB devices can be used as a context rule to provide access to something. That can be data, that can be an application. We have a police force using this solution so that there are two people that have unique USB devices and they both need to be available, they need to insert their USB device inside a machine to have access to an application for iPrincipal. A very easy way if you have a solution that can act on context. And once the context is created, once you know in which situations you want to deliver an IT service, then you can act on the context. It's not the other way around. It's not first predefining the application, delivering the application, and then when it arrives, you think, oh, but how should it act in this situation? First, detect context, and based on the context, provide, and we call that, compose the desktop, just in time. Any change in context will automatically recreate the desktop. That's the demo that Jeff was talking about. So please, if you are interested in seeing this context awareness in action, taking my laptop offline and suddenly my business application disappear, real time, please come by our booth. So we just want to emphasize it's not only about device and the user. There are much more context rules that you might need in your organization to create this dynamic desktop experience, to really follow the user in his work style, in his context, with the IT, with the services that he or she needs in that particular work style. What Bob was showing you there, that menu that popped up, that's where it hit home for me about a year ago, you know, when I was looking at RES software and understanding what context was all about. I looked at that list and I saw things like user properties, USB devices, IP segment definitions. That's when I started to realize that this is far beyond just the OS telling me it's gone into a different network segment or a different Wi-Fi being connected to. Because even in a certain network, you're going to have different experiences based on where you are. You know, you different printers and all that kind of stuff at a very basic level. But this goes way beyond that capability. So there's really no limit to how you may want to reach out and define in your IT service model what context may look like. Very cool. Okay, this so... Is, I'm sorry, this is you. No, no, no problem. I wanted to take over. They didn't know what I... Keep going, Bob. ...tell when they just see this picture. <laughs> so we talked about being able to automate the delivery of IT services. So once I know the runbook to deliver something, the next step is, and we think that is the most important step in the IT as a service process, when does somebody qualify? So all those app stores, for example, if I go to the marketplace on the Windows phone, I have about who knows how many apps there are already in the App Store? 50,000? I get to see everything. What if I only get to see 
what I'm interested in. What if I only get to see, and those are great improvements that were presented this morning, what if I get to see from within the Intune managed environment by System Center only the apps that my company wants me to use? So it's about when does somebody qualify for an IT service? The most important step. But then, once we know when somebody qualifies, based upon the context of the user again, and then we are touching the organizational context, which is different than a device or who I am within the Active Directory. For example, a lawyer, in that firm there are two people working, two roles. You are either a lawyer or you are a secretary. So, can I provide access to all my documents to the type lawyer? No. Then we have clients, which is organizational context. Or in a building company, then the project is important to tell me what services I have access to, instead of my role that I'm a contractor. So the organizational context is part of when should I get what service. Once we know when somebody qualifies, we need to trigger. We need to start delivering. But again, do we want to provide all the IT services in a service catalog where people need to pick what they want to use? So you start working at a new company, you get an empty desk, and you get this thousand applications, and you just pick what you need and hope that the combination works correctly? That's not the way. We already can predict what somebody needs. Based upon the organizational context, based on those business rules, we can predict that somebody does need a user account. They do need an email box. They do need some specific distribution lists. And we know that already. So why should I let my user pick the distribution list if I already know it? So the trigger of delivering IT services, we think that at least 80% we can predict based upon the context and only that 20% that remains should be provided in a kind of shopping list experience, in a kind of app store experience. And within that 20%, just leave out the ones that he probably will never use or that he is not allowed to use. So that is IT as a service. At least that's our vision of IT as a service. First, automate. So be able to deliver something with a run book as an IT service. An IT service is the ability to do something, the ability to work. But an IT service can also be, I want to follow a training on Microsoft Outlook. That can also be an IT service. So it's much broader than just applications. Once you know when somebody should get the service, it's either predictable so we can deliver automatically. I'm sure that nobody in this room ever needed to request or order a table and a plate and a knife and a fork in a restaurant because they could already predict that you wanted that. So only the things that are personal you were able to pick from the menu. So that is what we think IT as a service. Qualify, then deliver automatically and the rest should be in the service catalog. And therefore automation is essential. So I want to quickly show you how we define IT services in a module of Automation Manager. And then I will show you how an organizational context change, somebody that is new in the company, that is changing to a different organizational unit in my company, suddenly gets a different desktop experience based on that organizational change. And then I will show you how this person can very easily do an IT or request an IT service, such as change my phone number. So within the component service orchestration, we can define IT services. The IT service has a qualification. So in this case, the Microsoft Office application has a qualification that only people within IT and the sales organization are allowed to use this application. But we don't want to automatically install because once we install, we have to pay. Some of them might not use the application. So this is a very good sample of something we want to put on this personal menu of this user. 
I also have services created for everybody that works within IT, and I have services for everyone that works within sales. Again, qualification step one. Once we qualify, we can determine how should I deliver. Should I deliver automatically? And what should I do? And one of those steps can be, I should first ask the manager for approval. Another step can be, okay, the manager has approved. Now I can kick off this particular runbook with these parameters. Another very important part of an IT service is, what should I do if somebody dequalifies? So if I move from corporate IT to another organization. In a lot of organizations today still, somebody that works there for 10 years has more permission than somebody that worked there for a few months. Why? Changing job roles will always give you your new permissions, but the discipline to remove your old permissions are not already in place because there are manual actions that need to be taken. So by thinking of an IT service in the way of when do I qualify, how do I deliver, and how do I deprovision those permissions, that is what we think an IT service should be. So, when I log on to Windows 7 Desktop, While he's logging in there, let me just kind of bring it back to a system center relationship here. When we talk about that delivery of the service, he talked about getting Visio down to a machine. That could be configuration manager. That could be MDOP at V, being, bringing that, that sequenced application down. So we're not trying to pretend to replace the delivery engine. We're not the delivery mechanism. We will invoke and run around and work with and automate that delivery mechanism. So you're still going to be able to use your investments. What we're providing on the front of that is a catalog in front of the user that allows them to select, request, or get approval for cer certain things. That invokes processes in the back. We have used the SDK to develop that, uh, the System Center SDK technology to, to expose that and instrument that into Configuration Manager, for example. And then use Configuration Manager's you know, enterprise world-class levels of delivery abilities to bring that down in the way that you're probably already doing today in some levels. So that's, I just want to bring that, bring that back to you as far as being clear. How so we I just logged on as A. Johnson, who is working for corporate IT. So as you can see, he has an Outlook, he has Microsoft Visio, uh, Visual Basic, technical guy. What you saw when I logged on was a splash screen detecting my context. And at that time, my desktop, the one that is the end result that you see now, was dynamically built up based upon my context. That is context of my device, of me in the organization. So. If I now go back to the service orchestration part, I will find this user because he is not performing well within corporate IT. We see that he has a very smooth speech, but actual capabilities behind the keyboard are very bad. So let's try to remove him from corporate IT. And maybe his smooth talk can help us in the sales organization. So this organizational change will trigger those deprovisioning activities for the corporate IT organization, as you can see over here, and the delivery of the sales organization permissions that I need. Only by simply changing somebody from department A to department B. I didn't do anything else. Because those business rules are in place, we know the context, and this can be done by a human resource organization without needing to call IT, because IT already defined context, defined IT services, and knows what needs to happen when somebody is changing. So deprovisioning is taken care of, provisioning is taken care of. So this user is still logged on. So what if his desktop is refreshed? Again, we see a change in context. His wallpaper has changed to the sales organization. Luckily, I don't have Visual Basic anymore because I really didn't understand it. But I do have my sales forecaster. I do have Salesforce to book my new uh, sales cycles. So that is a dynamic IT based upon context and then based upon the context change, deliver and return those services. 
Then the service catalog, because Microsoft Outlook, signature, very important. People need to be able to call me, especially in my new role in sales, if they want to buy something. But they forgot to fill in my phone number. So how many IT organizations today still do this by calling the help desk for a phone number change? Are there people in the room that still take care of this within the IT organization? No? Oh, that's cool. It's, so, an, it's an AD property. Uh, it's not usually exposed to an end user, right? We don't, we don't want them in there. We don't want them going into AD users of computers and putting this in. So the idea is that the end users have their own service catalog. Within the service catalog, they have available services, which is that personalized menu of IT services. Within my list of available services, I can change my phone number. I want to request this service. This phone number change doesn't require any approval from my manager, but it can involve approval. So access to a human resource database might require approval of somebody who is end responsible for the human resource database. I simply fill in my own te phone number, and this goes back to the Automation Manager product. The parameter new phone number will be filled in the runbook. The runbook will do the tricks within Active Directory, and I will get a message when this is done, and then you will see that my signature will automatically change based upon what I have provisioned myself. So it's not about application delivery only. Any task that IT is still responsible for today that you can automate, you can delegate. Everything that is not important and that you are allowed to delegate, open source software. <coughs> Why have a debate about whether they can install Adobe Agrobat or not? Or whether they can use uh, 7-Zip or not? It doesn't cost any money. Just put it in their service catalog. Give them the freedom they want. If you provide freedom, they won't search outside your company for freedom. If you restrict, they will buy their MacBook. Why? Because today, corporate IT cannot yet manage my laptop so, or my MacBook, so I'm free again. If we provide some flexibility, some freedom within our infrastructure, they won't shop outside corporate IT organizations. So I've received a message that my phone number has been changed. So now finally I can send out an email to my potential customer with the quote and he can call me back to say yes, go for it. I was able to do that as an end user. I didn't call my corporate IT organization. My corporate IT organization was in the same time that this was happening busy with empowering, with enabling uh, the organization with implementing new solutions instead of keeping the lights on. So this could be anything. This could be, I want somebody to come and train me on how to use Visio. Or this could be, uh, my, uh, my monitor is, uh, is too small. I need a bigger monitor, some new hardware. Uh, it could be, give me a software application. And that may or may not require any kind of approval or workflow. But when you think about how your users are asking for things today, this can be one way that you start to provide your services and then build up your service catalog and get their adoption and get their buy-in. And it's a way that you can start to provide service right down to their machine where they're working. Okay. So this is you. preparing for IT as a service. We talked about context. It's very important to understand the context of our end user or of the work styles that are being used today. Uh, are there people in this room that provide service to end users? So uh, service providers, consultancy firms? How many of you experienced a customer that said, look, this is my set of applications, this is my uh, network topology, and everything was correct? I haven't experienced any customer that knows all the applications and when and where and how they are being used in the organization. And what if you start a project and you suddenly discover during the project, after it has already been accepted, that it's a very complex organization. So being able to understand the context, and then based on that, being able to build the context-aware infrastructure, that's key. 
So we provide a free offering called Baseline Desktop Analyzer, Jeff already referred it, that allows you with a very lightweight executable that runs within the context of the user to discover application usage, data usage, hardware, anything that you need to be able to provide in a very flexible way. Recently, we even added Dropbox users. Why? Because when we started talking with our customers about hyperdrive, they thought that nobody was using Dropbox in their organization. And it appeared that a lot of organizations do have Dropbox without people knowing. So this service is running in the Microsoft Azure cloud. So Windows Azure is empowering you, together with the software that's running in the cloud, to create those reports. So you go to the website, resbaselinedesktopanalyzer.com. You simply register. Once you register, you can download a little piece of software, which is an executable, that you can either inject in a logon script or install. It's really up to you how you want to touch your endpoint. Then once the sampler is running within the user context and it's taking a snapshot, so it will not decrease performance of your session. It's taking a snapshot of the user and it will look to the applications available to the user that are actually being used by the user. And that information can then be uploaded to this service. Once the software or the samples are uploaded and a sample is about 4K per user, then you can start creating reports. We will create reports automatically. Once the reports are finished, we will send you an email on those reports. These are the type of reports that you can expect. Of course, a summary, but also a very detailed report about the hardware. What type of system do I have? What type of processors do I have? Memory, etc. A hardware inventory for free. Application landscape. What is my top 10 applications in my organization? But more important, what are those rare applications that I'm not aware of? If you're doing a migration, and you're, you forget that one application that is so important for a particular organizational unit, then you will have a very busy day on Monday after the migration. User population, what type of users do I have? How many people have their own laptop? Or are sharing machines? So I have maybe one dedicated machine for a person I can deal differently with than uh, the people that are using uh, terminal services. How many laptops do I have in my organization? Printer topology. Where are which printers and wh what printers are actually being used? Because if we want to provide Follow Me IT and we want to enable the printer to follow the user, we need to know where the printers are, what printers are being used by the user. And location layout. So what are the locations in my organization? So it's really a bummer if you figure out during a project that they have a few subnets with 50 other users on another subnet that you, wasn't, you were not aware of. Then you suddenly have to drive to that location, figure out what to do to get them up and running. And of course, also, how many Dropbox users do I have in my organization? So I'll quickly show you a sample of the report itself. So detailed information about hardware, detailed information about applications, what applications are rarely used but maybe very important for my organization for business processes, what is my user population, how many roaming versus non-roaming users do I have, how many laptop users, how many Dropbox users within my organization. So we will provide you for free the information to prepare for IT as a service. Once you have these reports, you know the context, you know the complexity, and you have the information to take the first step, which is automation. So, last slide, ARIES Software and Microsoft. We touch the product baseline desktop analyzer, ARIES Workspace Manager, which is the context-aware solution to create dynamic desktops, create a desktop, compose a desktop based upon the context. Once the context is changing, the desktop will change according to the change of the context. And Automation Manager, the solution where you can automate your manual tasks today, where you can create those run books in a very intuitive way to automate those processes and to create those IT services. 
both Workspace Manager and Automation Manager work very well together with System Center Configuration Manager. So if you have a System Center Configuration Manager infrastructure for software distribution, we will leverage that. Don't throw it away. It works great together. So you can create a run book, and part of the run book can be install software on these devices. I can even use within the context awareness of Workspace Manager, which is not only device and user, but which can be a serial number of a USB device, invoke Configuration Manager to install software based on the serial number of that USB device. So if you do need that uh, level of context detection, then you can let it work together with Configuration Manager. Orchestrator. So if you have already processes in place, runbooks in place in Orchestrator, and you want to invoke them from Automation Manager, because a runbook in Automation Manager also needs to kick off something you already have today, that's no problem. Also the other way around. So from within Orchestrator, we have a web service that you can use to invoke tasks in Automation Manager. We have customers that are really interested in Orchestrator, but they don't have yet the knowledge about the infrastructure. So let them start with Automation Manager. Let them understand Rambook Automation. And when they grow, they can, then they can grow towards a more mature system center infrastructure, where they can use the orchestrator again. And they can reuse what they already built in Automation Manager. So Service Manager, if there are incidents and those incidents need action, I can again invoke Automation Manager to kick off a Rambook that will take care of the fix of a problem. Operations manager, so if something happens in my infrastructure, what if I have to redeploy virtual machines based upon outage of a node? I can automatically do that by event triggered uh, by uh, operation manager, kick off a runbook in automation manager. And of course, we already discussed this, Windows Azure is used. The product is powered by, officially certified by Microsoft, uh, is using the Windows Azure Cloud. For us, it started as research. We really want to grow together with Microsoft into cloud offerings, and we were able to create a great, powerful service for partners, for customers, to get valuable information to prepare for IT as a service. But we use all the technologies, all the components, all the roles within Azure to do that. So that is how we work together. RES software is not about... Uh, their own solutions. It's about leveraging Microsoft technologies and helping you as partners, as customers, to actually get most out of the Microsoft solutions. So as I said, last slide about the products, but this one is very important as well. Please fill in your evaluation. There are prizes as already told uh, by Microsoft. Uh, fill in your evaluations. For us, it's very important. Uh, if you have some uh, advices, please fill it in. Uh, we will uh, always uh, change our presentation based upon the feedback. The presentation itself will be shared, I think, to all the attendees, uh, whether it's downloaded or uh, DVD. I think DVDs will be uh, shared. So all the decks, I hope that nobody took a lot of notes, because you will get the presentation. And we want to thank you and open the floor for any questions you might have. Any questions? Remarks? I think we're between them and a cold beer, so it's probably... No, uh, there's a question. Is there any software creation as far as taking off any people, PeopleSoft has standard interfaces like web services to uh, talk to, uh, yes. No problem. Thanks for sharing your time with us, everybody. Uh, I hope your week is, is uh, enjoyable. I hope you survive. And uh, we hope you all get home safe. So thanks for being with us. Thank you.